Um, hi guys, welcome to the Med Crash Course series. So today we are doing finals crash course on cardiology part two with Dr. Lakshmi. So just in, oh, sorry. Yeah. So just in the top right corner is a QR code for our Instagram page. So please scan and follow. And in the bottom left corner is our email address. So if you have any questions later on, please do email us. Um, and just to note, these slides have been recycled from last year's teaching. So if you go on to the next one. So this is the QR code for the polls. So if you guys want to scan and join in the polls, we'll give it a couple of minutes. Um, assuming you got it up on your phone as well. Cool. So uh, you can have full control of that. Do you want to just start the session? Mm -hmm. I'm on the home page. One second, it seems to be loading. Sec, let me re-log in. Sorry? I'm just going to re-log in again because it okay. just keeps um, circling. I think it might have logged out. I think it's been acting a little bit funny today, actually. Yeah, oh, I had it logged in. But, um, give me a second. Has that worked? I hope I haven't started geriatrics and I've started. Coffee. No, you started this one, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Cool, that started. All right, cool. So I'll hand over to you. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thanks. All right, hi guys. So today we're covering these topics. Um, so we're just covering the major topics. Our part one session was on arrhythmias and ECGs. So today we're covering ACS, angina, hypertension, and heart failure. So we'll crack on how it's going to work is we'll go through some questions and then cover vision topics. So we revise the content for those topics. So first question, let me just open up a poll. So um, you can read it, but I'll read it out as well. 61 year old man is admitted with chest pain to ED. ECG shows ST elevation and leads two, three and AVF. And his past medical history is hypertension and he takes ramipril, aspirin and a statin. So what do you think is the optimum management for these for this patient? Those are the options. I'll give you a minute or so to answer. I'm not receiving any responses through. I don't know if it's acting up. But for the interest of time, we'll move on. So the answer is the last one. So you'd start, we load him with aspirin and cloppy, cover with IV heparin and arrange for immediate PCI within 90 minutes because this gentleman's got ST elevation MI. So PCI is a gold standard treatment for a STEMI. Um, next question, I'll open up the poll. Give me a second. Right. It is loading, the poll should open up soon. So, 66 year old man, um, no past medical history of note, comes in again with chest pain to ED. ECG shows ST elevation in the anterior leads and he's loaded with aspirin and ticagrelor before going for PCI. Do you know what the mechanism of Ticagrelor is? It's a bit of an academic question, but 
something that could easily come up. And final. I'll give you guys a minute. OK, let's move on. So basically it inhibits ADP binding to plate receptors. That's the mechanism of action. And it's similar to clopidogrel as well. So covering ACS, ACS is a syndrome and it includes a set of symptoms resulting from ischemia of the heart. And broadly speaking, you can categorize it as your um, unstable angina and n STEMI, and then as a STEMI. There's different ways of classifying MIs. I've also got this picture on the slide here. You can see my mouse. So most commonly what we'll see is a type 1 MI followed by a type 2 MI. The other types of MIs are a bit more rarer. And essentially common symptoms, as you will probably know, are chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting and hemodynamic instability, which isn't really a symptom, it's more of a sign. And these this little graph here essentially shows the rise and peak in troponins or creatinine kinase, which some trust may still use, but most people tend to use troponin I and troponin T to assess for myocardial ischemia. Moving on, so management of ACS. Everyone probably knows the acronym MONAC to morphine plus antiemetic, oxygen only if they're desaturating. Nitrates, again, only if their blood pressure is above 90 systolic blood pressure, because as you know, it's a vasodilator and you don't want to drop someone's blood pressure if it's already compromised. Aspirin and copy, which you start loading doses of and then continue with daily doses. Um, PCI indications, this is something that's really important that you need to know for exams, because you could be presented with a variety of questions all sort of sounding similar with an age and chest pain and the sort of specific signs that would make you go towards a PCI versus just medical management. So if it's a STEMI, you have to aim to get primary PCI done within 90 minutes. Um, if um, it's an N STEMI, you tend to consider the risks of doing a PCI and whether this is actually a low risk um, MI, which could be managed as an outpatient. We'll discuss how you might consider doing that later on in the next slides. Anticoagulation has to be started for all MI patients regardless, unless of course there are active contraindications, for example, if they're bleeding, um, in which case that's a senior, dis that's a senior discussion and um, I doubt that sort of scenario is going to come up for your final. It's a bit um, out there. Also, um, you would consider cabbage, which is coronary artery bypass grafting. Um, again, that's not something as an F1 would be your decision to make, and it depends sort of what trusts or the way you'd be working out. But for the point of exams, people who tend to have multi vessel disease or um, you know known like CTCA results that show coronary artery narrowing would be candidates for bypass. And post MI. This is something again that's really important that might be tested on in finals is knowing that you need to start patients on an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, providing that they can tolerate it. Again, these are shown to have prognostic benefits post MI, which is why we start them, as well as a statin to control obviously plaque and plaque stability and also DAPT. So you tend to have your copy or Ticara law that you loaded them on to continue for one year since the day you started it and aspirin lifelong and obviously PPI is a cover because you're increasing their risk of bleeding. Next slide. So next question. The following ECG is taken on one of the patients who were admitted onto a surgical ward complaining of chest pain and has had some vomiting and maybe spiking temperatures. What do we think the most likely diagnosis is? I will open up the next poll. We've got a minute or so.
I'm just going to move on with interest of time. It's well done if you got the answer with C, it's an anterior STEMI. I'll try and show it with my mouse here. I don't know if that comes across, but you can see here you've got quite noticeable ST elevation in these areas. So moving on. Again, it's important to know generic regions because they correlate to the blood supply of the heart and potentially where the blockage may be. So as you all probably know, and this is a good thing to remember, if you've got an inferior MI, it tends to be in your leads 2, 3 and AVF, and your inferior region tends to be supplied by your RCA. And as a result, you can also get some arrhythmias or heart blocks as well, because the RCA tends to be, not always, but tends to be the dominant supply for your SA node. And again, I'm sure you all know this in the supervision, V1 and V2 and V3, V4 are all sort of supplied by the LAD and various parts of the LAD and branches of it, including the diagonal, etc. So generally, anteroceptal changes correspond with an LAD and lateral changes leaves us with a circumflex. So that's V5, V6, lead one and ABL. So always remember that ST elevation or any ST change, if it's an NMI, will have reciprocal changes. And a good way to remember it is PALES. Essentially, if you've got a posterior MI, then you'll see changes anteriorly. And if you've got anterior, then you'll see it inferiorly, inferior, you'll see lateral, and then lateral, you'll see posteriorly. So, I mean, sorry, septally. So what we're trying to show here essentially is if you've got ST elevation here anteriorly, you're going to see ST depression over here, which is inferior. So always make sure you keep an eye out that if you are seeing, for example, say you've got an exam question, then maybe this didn't seem as obvious and you started looking at leads one, two and three and thought, oh, great, dealing with an end STEMI. Then always make sure to check that there aren't any reciprocal changes. Also, another really important point is um, remember what classifies as significant ST elevation, because sometimes you might be often you find that you might be like trying to convince yourself if there's like a bit of an elevation, but then you see maybe that's the case across all leads, in which case this is unlikely to be sort of pointing towards an STEMI. So it tends to be within the same cardiac territory. So the previous slide before where we discussed which areas are supplied by which main arteries and then also you would see at least ST depression in the reciprocal areas that's more sort of indicative of a STEMI. Moving on so question four let me get the poll open give me one sec right so 55 year old gentleman, again, surprise, surprise, is admitted with chest pain. And this time their ECG shows ST depression in the inferior leads. Um, he requires some morphine to settle the chest pain. His history, past medical history, includes the fact that he had an MI two years ago, which he required thrombolysis for. He also has asthma and type 2 diabetes. So he started treatment with aspirin, coffee, and unfractionated heparin. Now, which of the following factors do you think? would determine whether we need to give him IV glycoprotein to be 3 a uh, receptor antagonist. Knows your options, I'll give you a minute. Okay, um, I'm going to call it that, interest of time. So well done if you got the answer correct. It is a high grace risk score and whether PCI should be performed or not. So grace scoring, I'm sure you guys have come across this. It's really quite important. Essentially, it helps decide whether we can conservatively manage um, an NSTEMI or NSTACS um, or if they will require follow up PCI. So. The score itself estimates your six month mortality risk with having had this event, um, an instant in your unstable angina. And as you can see here, people who score low, which is a score between one to 88, have a less than 3% probability of death post discharge. And this is just a screenshot of um, the MD calc 
um, great scoring. I don't think the final team will be, it would be very mean if they asked you to calculate someone's great score. I suspect questions will be based around someone's got an intermediate grace score, someone's got a high grace score. What would you like to do in terms of management? If that makes sense. OK. The next question, 65 year old. Um, let me open up the poll. 65 year old, seen by his GP for worsening shortness of breath. No chest pain, no cough. I was admitted three weeks ago and treated for um, anterior STEMI with PCI. He also has a background of asthma and high cholesterol. Torn examination, he's slightly tachycardic, but oxygen sats seem to be fine, blood pressure seems to be okay. ECG shows sinus tachy with anterior concave ST elevation in V1 to V5 associated with deep Q waves. So what do we think is happening here? I'm going to give you some time to answer. Right. Let's have a look. So, ST elevation post MI, you're always worrying about left ventricular aneurysm. You're removing all the complications of MI. Here we go. So, we'll cover all of these um, individual complications in a bit. Just another question. So, we'll open up the poll. 65 year old again, a presenter to ED this time with chest pain, has a history of hypertension. Um, his examination findings are normal. ECG shows ST elevations in V1 to V4. Um, but he's sent home and the patient reports dyspnea to you two days later. His heart rate is slightly tacky, again similar to the previous gentleman, but blood pressure is 89 over 62. He's got a high rest rate and oxygen sets at 84% on air. He's now got a widespread pansystolic murmur, now just in the mitral area, with widespread crackles an echo doesn't show a pericardial effusion. So what complication do you think is most likely given this presentation? I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to answer. All right, then stop the points. So the answer is rupture of the papillary muscle. So essentially when your papillary muscle ruptures, um, who's post an MI, you can cause acute mitral regurgitation and that's what causes the murmur. And a result of the acute mitral regurgitation results in a flash pulmonary edema picture. So that's why they've also got really widespread crackles, which are bilateral and they're also hypertensive. So complications of MI, I apologize, there's quite a busy slide. Ways to think of this in terms of revision is just obviously remember complication, obvious complication is death, but try and split it up in terms of acute complications and sort of mid to long term complications. So in terms of your acute complications, you can have acute pulmonary edema or heart failure, cardiogenic shock, which we'll cover in a bit more detail later, arrhythmias. Often it tends to be ventricular arrhythmias, which is um, you know more fatal, so VT or VF. And it, I think it's the most common cause of death post MI VF. You can also get bradyarrhythmias with AV block, and that's common, like I said, with the inferior MIs because your RCA supplies your SAN. You also can get rupture of the free wall, cardiac tamponade, pericarditis in the first 48 hours, and you would see an effusion, so that's why. It's important to note that the echo in the previous question showed um, an effusion wasn't apparent on the bedside echo because that could have been in keeping with the pericarditis picture. And of course, the acute MR, which we explained before due to ischemia and um, rupture of the papillary muscles, which control the mitral valve. Now, um, coming on to sort of mid midterm complications of an MI, you can get again congestive heart failure. You can also get the free wall rupture. It tends to occur about one to two weeks and not as acute. Um, in terms of exam questions, just be aware of time scales. I think they wouldn't be too mean in causing, you know, 
making your time to go seem a bit um, obscure, but it tends to happen one to two weeks. Um, and approximately 3% of patients, so it's actually quite common. And you can get acute heart failure secondary to tamponade. So again, tamponade clinical signs show that um, you'll have a raised JVP, pultus paradoxus, um, low blood pressure, and heart sounds will sound far away or diminished. And of course, you know, treatment for that is to drain the fluid from the pericardium, so pericardiocentesis. Also in the following weeks, you can also get valve disease. And in weeks to months, you can experience an aneurysm. So that's where you have persistent ST changes despite having had intervention and um, left ventricular failure. So again, your heart failure picture, generally speaking, you'll tend to see the risk of heart failure is present throughout all time scales post an MI. And um, with an aneurysm, the most important thing for exams to think about is um, these patients are at high risk of thrombus and therefore a risk of stroke, so they need to be properly anticoagulated. So you'll often see if someone's got a thrombus that we've detected post an aneurysm on echo, then they'll be on anticoagulation. And finally, another sort of common exam question that I've noticed before is dressless syndrome. This is essentially pericarditis, but um, it's weeks, so you need to remember that you can have pericarditis in the first two days of an MI, and that's an acute complication. Dressless syndrome tends to be a couple of weeks post MI, so two to six, and this is mediated by an autoimmune response to the proteins um, that you know recover from uh, the MI. Treatment for that is similar to treat treatment for pericarditis, and you just treat with NSAIDs, so cultures. And of course, remember that an MI can reoccur at any time. So moving on to cardiogenic shock, this is something that's, mm, I don't know, I feel like I didn't get much teaching on at medical school, but it's quite important to be aware of. Essentially, the, the driver of cardiogenic shock is pump failure, so the heart is failing to sustain a decent cardiac output. And um, this tends to be due to tissue hyperperfusion, so essentially ischemia, that causes its inability to pump enough to get around, to get enough um, output around the body. Now, it's quite difficult to treat this because, as, as I've mentioned on the slides, you have to sort of correct the underlying cause of the tissue hyperperfusion. So that's why you, you'd send these patients straight for PCI or if it's due to a toxic cause, if they've had um, um, I don't know, digoxin toxicity, then you need to correct these underlying causes to improve the contractility of the heart. In sort of situations where you are in a centre that can offer it, they can consider giving um, an intra-aortic balloon pump. I think that's quite um, almost academic and I'm not sure that will be tested, but you can be aware that that is an option of treatment in cardiogenic shock. But more often you see that patients in cardiogenic shock get put in inotropic support. One takeaway point with cardiogenic shock is if you can, obviously you know the mechanism of how it works, so the heart is failing to pump, but the signs can look very similar to, for example, a septic shock picture where someone's got low blood pressure and they're tachycardic because you know, they're trying to compensate with an increased heart rate to get the cardiac output out. And um, you'd notice that patients who don't respond to boluses of fluid may be at risk, may be having um, cardiogenic shock. So if you get, I don't know, a question where someone could, like presents to you in shock, septic shock tends to be the more common type of shock and would be like can present quite similarly to cardiogenic shock. The sort of differentiating feature between both would be that cardiogenic shock would actually worsen with fluid boluses, which is something you'd consider giving with someone with a low blood pressure and tachycardic. And obviously that makes sense because the heart is already failing to pump. So if you add more fluid in, as it were, it's going to worsen the problem. So this little diagram is from, I think, the BART's um, cardiogenic shock classification. It's quite a nice chart. And yeah, I think that's all you need to know about shock really. And these are the causes. So multiple causes, essentially pump failure is why you get cardiogenic shock. So next question, let me open the polls. 
I'll give you a minute. Seventy-eight year old presents with shortness of breath, productive cough and a wheeze. And they've also got widespread crackles. What do you think your most likely diagnosis would be? Right, we can stop the poll. So the answer is, of course, pulmonary edema. This is a cardio teaching session, but um, the clues obviously from the question are the widespread crackles. And if you look at this chest X-ray, it's in keeping with pulmonary edema, which we'll discuss on the next slide. So, acute pulmonary edema, or flash pulmonary edema, as you might hear it being called, um, is essentially due to LV failure that results in backflow of fluid. So, what you can see is this little image on the top right side shows the signs that you'd see on a chest x-ray as well as the image at the bottom. So, you've got dilated prominent upper lobe vessels. Essentially, you can see what looks like a bat's wing appearance. Um, cardiomegaly, of course. Also, you'll notice plural effusion, so you won't have nice sharp um, sort of lines at the base of the lungs, which would be present otherwise. And um, you can sometimes convince yourself if you can see interstitial edema, which is the curly B lines, but I don't think I'm very good at noticing that. You tend to just look for effusions the size of the heart, um, whether it just looks congested with the vessels or um, in the bat's wing appearance. And sometimes you can see fluid in the fissure lines as well, which can be a clue for pulmonary edema. So management for pulmonary edema. I found a pretty useful mnemonic I learned at med school was PODMAN. So that's positioning, oxygen, diuretic, morphine, antiemetics and nitrates. So positioning, these patients will present acutely short of breath and it's actually quite distressing to see someone in pulmonary edema because they just can't breathe, they struggle to catch their breath. So position them sort of at a 45 degree angle. You can also help by lifting their legs up, but um, generally just sitting them up as opposed to lying them down flat helps. Also giving oxygen and diuresis, the most important part of your management for pulmonary edema is diuresis. Morphine is debated. It's it's supposed to just because these people, these patients will present quite distressed and short of breath, morphine is supposed to well, help them in terms of managing the anxiety maybe around shortness of breath. I don't think there is direct clinical benefit from giving morphine for the pulmonary edema. It's more in terms of supportive management of the pulmonary edema, as well as an antiemetic, which is always something you should prescribe as a reflex with morphine and nitrates, providing their blood pressure can tolerate it. So again, I think for exams, I, literature like recent literature, like I said, also says avoid opioids, and I put the sort of mechanism as to why they say you might need to avoid opioids, but I think with most question banks, it's still relatively accepted as part of your management. So, yeah. So, in going to diuretics, um, you should, if in doubt, just start IV for as many 40 milligrams start stat dose. And then you can convert it into an IV infusion if required. So, I've written here the onset of action and why we prefer IV over PO for azamide. You prefer IV because it's faster acting, of course, and um, you can repeat doses of furosemide if there's no response. So if this is pulmonary edema and you know, you've know taken a chest x-ray, anyone that's short of breath and comes to a &E gets a chest x-ray. So you've looked at the chest x-ray, it's convincing, you've examined them, but they're not responding to 40 milligrams, you repeat essentially, okay? And you monitor someone's urine output and weight loss because if they present to you with acute overload, that probably means they've gained on fluid weight uh, over the past couple of days or however long this has developed. So you need to monitor their weight, daily weights, target their urine output. Um, roughly it's about 100 mils per, per hour, but um, 
Again, I don't know if you get tested on the specifics of those numbers. And always remember, if they're on bumetanide, stop the bumetanide because you're covering them with IV diuretics. There's no need to continue the oral bumetanide. You can switch them back to that once they've improved from the acute stage. OK, and always monitor their potassium. As you know, diuretics can cause hypokalemia. And that's it. Also, a common thing that you listen more towards clinical practice rather than in exams, you'll note that patients will often have maybe impaired renal function or their usernames suggest an AKI, but actually holding furosemide in a situation like this because you're worried about the AKI would be detrimental because the reason why or what may be precipitating an AKI is the fact that the kidneys are hypoperfused because they're in acute pulmonary edema. So it might seem contraindicative in most scenarios, you know, when you're thinking of an AKI, you'd be like, oh, hold the diuretic or, you know, stop nephrotoxics. But in this clinical situation, it's generally, you know, you have to give a frozen light because that will improve the perfusion to the kidneys and therefore they will start to improve. OK. These are just investigations that you can consider doing in someone with acute heart failure. So BMP is always a good idea, especially if they've not got a formal diagnosis of heart failure. There is some question as to the benefit of testing BMP once someone has a diagnosis of heart failure, but I don't think there's any harm. You can still measure BMP. Um, like we said, monitor electrolytes. That's really important with heart failure. And you can notice deranged LFTs in two, and that's just due to the congestion or the backlog in the venous system, which can cause pardon me, a um, transient rise in your AST and ALT. And yeah, echo, of course, really important. When someone comes in with heart failure and they've not had a recent echo, um, the main reason why you want an echo is to assess what the rejection fraction is doing and where you can classify these patients because heart failure again is much like a syndrome and it's an umbrella term and there's specific types of heart failure which respond to different treatments so it's good to know an ejection fraction because this is one of the major ways we classify heart failure which i will cover in a bit so again apologies for a busy slide this will probably be useful for revision but this is chronic heart failure management. Essentially, you guys should know that if someone wants, say, for example, they've come in with acute heart failure, you've treated the acute heart failure and you've switched them back to oral diuretics, you need to think about long term management when you're discharging these patients. And that's an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, an ARB if the patient's intolerant. And second line is adding in an MRA, so a mineraloreceptor antagonist. Um, so that's aldosterone, sorry, spironolactone or clarinone. Um, there is a risk of hyperkalemia because these diuretics are potassium sparing, of course. So avoiding people with CKD. Um, and then third line, which is a bit more specialist, and I've put here for revision the sort of indications that you may see if you get an exam question as to a patient's already on ACE inhibitor and beta blocker and an MRA, but you need to add another agent on. I often find that you'll get asked for, for example, HEF-REF, which is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Entresto will be a popular choice to add on as um, a management option. Remember that Entresto is um, Secubitril and Valsartan, and Valsartan is an ARB, so there's a washout period and you should stop your pre-existing ACE inhibitor or ARB 48 hours before starting on the Entresto, but I think that's more of a um, prescribing slash work um, info point rather than an exam question. I'm not sure you'd get tested for that on your exam questions. Um, also, a common question will be if someone is of Afro-Caribbean origin, hydralazine and nitrate often works better in these patients as well. Or if they've got a background of diabetes too, it's um, very popular now to start people on dapagliflozin or empagliflozin management of HEFRA. And these tables below are just doses for your ACE inhibitors, your beta blockers and your carbs. Right. Moving on, so 
Like I said, classification of heart failure. Uh, it's good to know your percentages. So HEF-REF is ejection fraction less than 40 and HEF-PEF, which is preserved ejection fraction is above 50. There is now, again, again, a bit more academic heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. So that's people who are the 41 to 50, like 49%, the in-between between reduced and preserved. And management of this is probably not something you'll get tested on in your finals. It's still an area of you know a lot of research and there's not official guidelines in terms of um, mid-range ejection fraction. Essentially, people think that if you've got, you people tend to either have HEF-PEF, but then when they um, deteriorate, they go into heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. And when you treat the preserved ejection fraction heart failure, it improves back up to 50%. Or if you've had people who are diagnosed in hospital with HEF-REF, so reduced ejection fraction, but they're responding to treatment and they're improving well, then they come into this area of mid-range ejection fraction where actually they're doing well and responding to treatment. So yeah, a bit of a niche area, but I thought I'd mention it. This is lifted from your nice clinical knowledge summaries. This chart is really good. Um, essentially, exam questions that you may be picked up on are knowing how quickly to refer patients on once, um, say, for example, you're in a GP setting and you've measured someone's BNP and it comes back greater than 2000. You need to know that that needs an urgent two week wait. It's almost essentially like a two week wait cancer referral because the morta well, not mortality, but the morbidity of um, heart failure is quite high and people often forget. That, um, that that's the case. Right, so chronic heart failure management. Again, these flow charts are really important. Just remember, you always start ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, then an MRA. And then the other things that you add on after that are specialist. But um, like I'd summarized in the slide before, there are specific indications to start in Tresto, for example, with reduced ejection fraction or hydrazine and nitrate, for example. So. Question eight, let me get the polls up. So 59 year old woman, history of chest pain um, that she notes on exertion, relieved at rest, um, takes aspirin and a statin and is on a maximum dose of tenolol, is still experiencing exertional chest pain. She has been compliant with her medication and has tolerated her medication since we've started them. What do you think would be the best um, medication to add on or, or even consider intervention as a next step in her management? I'll give you a minute to answer the questions. OK, so I'll stop the poll. The answer is start and not a pain. So we're going to go through angina um, management in a bit. Um, the next question I'll open up the poll for is a 56 year old male, a seen in cardiology clinic, has been experiencing chest pain on exertion. Um, GPs diagnosed it as angina previously, gave them lifestyle advice, which is really important. Always remember that it can crop up on exam questions as well. And started him on aspirin, statin and GTN spray. Otherwise, well, no past medical history. You're reviewing the patient in clinic today and um, they're still suffering with ongoing anginal symptoms. ECG shows normal sinus rhythm. What do you think your next course of action would be for this patient? I'll give you a minute to respond. Brilliant. OK, I'm going to shut the poll. So you would comment this patient on verapamil. Let's go through this now. Angina, again, a very common topic that can come up in exam questions, so good to revise. Um, all patients with angina should receive an aspirin and statin, providing there's no obvious contraindication, and PR and GTN to abort any um, anginal attacks they may uh, experience. 
The first line is a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker as monotherapy. Um, and you, you tend to use, if you're using monotherapy, you'd use a rate limiting calcium channel blocker. So that's your verapamil, your diltiazem. Remember, if they're still symptomatic, you can add on a calcium channel blocker, but this would be the dihydropyridine type. So that's your amlodipine, um, nifedipine, for example. Never start a patient on both verapamil and a beta blocker because you will drop their heart rate. Um, if, for, however, you know, you started a patient on monotherapy, but they can't tolerate, you know, another addition of a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker due to side effect profile, then you can consider starting things like either sorbide mononitrate, which is something you commonly see in patients with angina, or evabridine, nicarandal, or renolazine. So it's good to be aware of these other medications. But your First line treatment is beta blocker or calcium channel blocker as monotherapy and then add on. OK. Another important thing that you may get tested on is if your patients are already on a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker, um, whilst in consideration of adding a third agent, so from the ones I listed before, for example, nitrates, you also need to see whether they need assessment for um, PCI or a cabbage because pain that remains uncontrolled despite optimal um, beta blocker and calcium channel blocker suggests that you know they have coronary artery disease that might be precipitating this that needs to be um, intervened with. So next question, let me open up the poll. Got a 55 year old man who comes to cardiology clinic with chest pain, has a history of previous STEMI, which he had angioplasty for, so PCI. Um, describes periods of worsening angina, which is limiting his exercise tolerance. His heart rate 60 and echo shows injection fraction 50 to 55, so preserved. Um, he's currently on amlodipine 10 milligrams and bisoprolol 10 milligrams. So what do you think is the most appropriate medication to start if you will require further investigation? I'll give you a minute or two to answer. I'm going to stop the poll. So you would start isosorbide mononitrate, and it's important to note the dosing of this. So at eight and two, okay. And you need asymmetrical dosing, they call it, um, to avoid sort of um, nitrate tolerance because people can build up a tolerance if you prescribe it as you would normally do in terms of eight a.m. and eight p.m. at night. So that's why it's not option D and option C. So next question, let me grab the poll. An Afro-Caribbean woman who's 45 years old uh, is given a new diagnosis of essential hypertension. Again, that's actually a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, we'll cover that in a bit. But what would be your first line option to treat her condition? This is, you will definitely get a hypertension questions in your final. So it's really important that you know your management of hypertension, both in the community and in the hospital. Um, really well. So I'll stop the poll. And the answer is, of course, I'm not a pain. Uh, we'll cover the, the contents for this in a bit. So let me open the poll for the next one. 75 year old man complaining of palpitation, shortness of breath, chest pain and nausea and vomiting. Has a background of diabetes, ischemic heart disease and hypertension. Um, you've done some blood tests for him. They've come back unremarkable except for potassium of 6.3. Now, which medication do you think might be causing or worsening this hyperkalemia? And that stop the poll. The answer is, of course, spironolactone, which we discussed before as a potassium sparing diuretic. So question number 13, also open. 45 year old man with high blood pressure comes to GP for a review and his blood pressure readings have unfortunately remained persistently raised. So previously they were about 155 over 80 and um, the GP organised to have ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, which shows a daytime average of about 138 over 85. 
He's already on the maximum dose of Vampril. What would be your second line agent to add? Remember the algorithm for um, hypertension management. It's a really good picture on nice clinical knowledge summaries. OK, brilliant. I'll stop the poll. Of course, the answer in this situation would be indapamide. He's already on an ACE inhibitor, so your next choice is adding a calcium channel blocker or a thiazide like diuretic. And although varafinil is a calcium channel blocker, remember you can't start someone on um, varafinil for management of hypertension. It's um, you want your non dihydroprotein calcium channel blockers for these patients. So. Hypertension, um, really important topic, definitely worth revising in detail, the finals. Essentially think of it as um, blood pressure is a spectrum, of course, and on average spectrum, we've deemed normal to be 180 and 80 um, for your systolic and diastolic readings, and anything where it starts to go above that is considered to be elevated. OK, um, stage one, obviously I've got the table here, is from 130 to 139. These numbers are really important to remember, and I would argue for purpose of exams, I tended to remember systolic blood pressures for sure, right, and didn't really focus on diastolic too much because systolic tends to be raised anyway. Um, but yeah, it's good to know both but I would focus on systolic numbers. Uh, stage one is 130, stage two is 140, and obviously a crisis is anything but 180. Now, you can think of causes of hypertension in multiple ways. Essentially, there's essential hypertension, which is basically hypertension when you've not found a secondary cause for it. Secondary causes are multiple, include things like a pheochromocytoma, Cushing's disease if someone's on steroids, um, if they've got CKD, any medications that may be they may be taking or contraceptives is often a common one that we forget to think about is associated with high blood pressure and complications or end stage um, organ damage from hypertension include obviously the risk of strokes and um, also the risk of an MI, hypertensive retinopathy and also hypertensive nephropathy, quite similar in that sense to diabetes. So. This table is really important. Definitely, definitely recommend memorizing this. Um, again, you need to know that um, your diagnosis of essential hypertension or hypertension in general, um, your limits for clinic blood pressures are slightly higher than ambulatory blood pressures. I guess that's accounting for white coat hypertension as well. So a classic question will be someone comes to your GP practice, got raised blood pressure, but then you do an ambulatory blood pressure and it's normal and that's often a diagnosis of white coat. OK, so. Hypertension management. Um, this table again, memorize it. Essentially, you need to remember that there are age and ethnicity restrictions for starting an ACE inhibitor and Generally, anyone over the age of 55 gets started on a calcium channel blocker and then it's stepwise. So A, C, and then you move on to add C or D, which is your calcium channel blocker or your diuretic. And remember, verapamil and diltiazem aren't calcium channel blockers that we use in hypertension management, um, as, as I mentioned before. OK, and once you've got resistant hypertension, despite your patients, for example, maybe being on as much as they can tolerate ACE inhibitor, calcium channel blocker and diuretic, you start considering either an alpha blocker or spironolactone or a potassium spraying diuretic. Again, the most important thing is to always check potassium um, before you start you know, adding a fourth agent on, and that should also be a trigger for them to be seen by um, an endocrine specialist or um, in hospital because it is quite uncommon and there might be underlying precipitating causes for resistant treatment resistant hypertension they need to investigate so it's a bit of a mean question but i know i presume you guys would have done your ong placements um either this year or the year before so you can get question on pregnancy things for finals um this is a 33 year old woman 
She is 22 weeks pregnant and is coming to her GP for routine antenatal appointment. It's her first pregnancy. She's not had any complications. No past medical history of note and her blood pressure is 148 of 92. You've repeated this again and it um, still remains high and you note from her records that she previously didn't have, she had a normal blood pressure pre -pre in early pregnancy. So on examination there's no edema and her reflexes are normal and that's her urine dip results which is negative for protein. What medication? Do you think we'd be starting her on? I'll give you a minute or two to answer. Brilliant. So well done to those of you who got it right. It's libitolol. I always think in pregnancy, libitolol is the first thing that crops up to mind with blood pressure. Um, it is indeed first line for pregnancy induced hypertension. Um, these are targets. I'd just I've put them there for revision purposes more than anything else. Remember that targets change with age. So, I mean, the main reason we aggressively control blood pressure is for the to prevent long term, you know, risks of, for example, stroke or worsening nephropathy or retinopathy. But after the age of 80, you can be a bit more relaxed with your targets um, because those long term complications are, you know, unlikely to be of concern at that age. Um, remember in diabetes, you have more strict control and you try to aim for 140 over 80, especially if you've got signs of end stage damage. And CKD as well, uh, particularly in patients who've got, um, you know, CKD3 or beyond with, um, that's an albumin q ratio of greater than 70, you like a tight control on their blood pressure. And yeah, we just covered that question on pregnancy. So treatment is often libitolol, and then you can consider niflenopine. Methyl dopa is a bit of a, an old drug that can still be used and is considered to be safe in pregnancy as well as hydralazine, but those tend to be um, later choices. So hypertensive crisis, again, um, pretty good exam question. Probably will get tested on it. Um, essentially, it's anyone that presents with uh, blood pressure over 180 or over 180 systolic or 120 diastolic and you'd be more concerned if they came to you with headaches or um, any chest pain or if they're not been passing water in the past 24 hours. These are all signs of end stage damage that would make you more concerned about a patient that say came in and had a systolic of 180. Um, management, again, uh, you tend to go for IV agents in these patients and you try to get control with IV labetalol. You can also start an IV, IVI, um, sorry, an infusion of GTN. And phantolamine, again, exam question for a uh, pheochromocytosis crisis, if you're suspecting. So. so another important topic, I'm not going to go through this whole table, this is here for your revision, so I hope you find it useful, um, is knowing side effects for antihypertensive, and especially if you have to do OSCEs, you can get stations where you are be asked to counsel people when you're starting them on an antihypertensive. Obviously really important, remember ACE inhibitor can cause a dry cough, can also cause dizziness, um, which is why some people take it in the evening before they go to bed. And um, beta blocker can cause bradycardia, obviously again, the dizziness, fatigue, bronchoconstriction, so you're thinking with your asthma patients, and um, erectile dysfunction, that's also an odd one that I know just cropped up and passed me quite a bit, but I chucked it in there. Okay. And key information that you need to remember is if someone's got bilateral renal artery stenosis, ACE inhibitors are contraindicated for obvious reasons. You know, you're, you're going to knock out any remaining kidney function. If someone has got, for example, renal artery stenosis that has been treated or stented and has patent blood supply, then they can be on an ACE inhibitor. So it's not an absolute contraindication, it's more the fact that if it hasn't been managed, you should not commence a more nice inhibitor. And what else have we got? Ah, beta blockers. Again, I think for exam purposes, just automatically think 
if someone's got asthma, don't give them the beta blocker. But in practice, anyway, um, beta blockers, you will see patients with asthma or well controlled asthma who are on a low dose of a cardio selective beta blocker because, um, you know, they seem to respond well to it. And um, it's only in patients with brittle asthma, so people who have recurrent admissions to hospital because of poor control over their asthma, who you would definitely not even consider giving a beta blocker if it were indicated. All right, right, moving on. So secondary cause of hypertension. So this is probably get, again tested on some of these um, causes of hypertension and it's important to consider. Um, I've split it up according to renal, vascular, endocrine, then your drug causes and just other um, conditions that can cause it. So with renal, you can always think if someone's less than 40, they, you know, it's quite young to be having hypertension, obviously will require specialist referral, but think about renal cancer. That's something you'd want to do, rule out. Um, again, urine dip is a highly useful test in the community to check for micro uh, hematuria. Vascular, again, you're thinking aortic um, coarctation or potentially renal artery stenosis. Again, these are diagnoses that are, I guess, um, you can pick up on clinical examination, but tend to be guided by imaging to rule those out. And endocrine is the one that has a lot of causes and often why you would do a referral to endocrine as part of your general medicine referral. So CON syndrome or primary hyperaldosteronism. So you've got high sodium, low uh, potassium. These patients often are alkalotic because they're um, producing a lot of bicarb. And you can often find a single like or a solitary adrenal adenoma um, visualized on MRI or CT. Treatment for these patients is a calcium channel blocker as um, preference. Again, pheochromocytoma, classic exam question. Someone comes in with labile blood pressure, postural drop in blood pressure as well, headaches, complaint of sort of sweating episodes or palpitations and abdominal pain. The tests you'd like to do in these patients are um, 24 hour free catecholamines as well as metanephrines. And um, it can be associated with those endocrine um, syndromes in men too or NF1 or one hippo Lindau syndrome. Cushing's again, steroid use, um, acromegaly is another endocrine cause of hyperthyroidism. Um, I guess of note, if someone's got a wildly raised diastolic blood pressure, that can point towards hypothyroidism. And um, in hyperthyroidism, they have a higher systolic blood pressure. These are medications, again, that can cause high blood pressure that are worth remembering. Licorice, of course, is one of them that I know it's just random, but in there, remember the pill. Um, that was often something we got a question on, like someone with no risk factors at all. And then you, you'll see in the history that they're on the pill, like the contraceptive agent. OK, right. Next question. I'll grab the poll open. Uh, only a couple of minutes left. So well done. Um, 74 year old woman known to have type 2 diabetes and is got a blood pressure that's borderline. You've decided she'd benefit from treatment. Her latest blood pressure is 146 systolic, HbA1c is 58, and she's got a slightly raised BMI 25. So what do you think the most appropriate drug would be to prescribe for this lady? Give you a second. Right, I'm going to speed it up. So the answer is amlodipine. Amazing. Um, no, not amlodipine. I apologise, that is a mistake on the answer slide. It's Ramipril. Always remember, even in that diagram which we covered before, nice CKS, diabetes trumps everything. So you'll be thinking about, oh, this, you know, this lady is old, so she's 74, so you're automatically thinking calcium channel blocker, which is the answer we've circled here. And, um, you know, You'd be thinking about ethnicity, which we've not mentioned here, but diabetes trumps all of that. So if someone has a known diagnosis of diabetes, start them on an ACE inhibitor, regardless of their age. OK, um, so these are just a couple of the questions that I found that I thought would be nice to um, give you guys. So we've come to the end of the presentation. It's just the last couple of questions. I've opened the poll. So 76 year old man with a background of IHD and hypertension 
comes from review. He had an MI 20 years ago, but has been asymptomatic since. He's currently on clopidogrel, astatin, rampro, and botoprolol, and like recently has been feeling lightheaded. ECG shows AF. Now, what would you do to his medications? Would you continue clopy monotherapy, or would you consider adding a statin in, or a DOAC slash NOAC, same thing? Um, yeah, I'll give you a minute to answer. Okay, so the answer is you'd switch him to a novel or anticoagulant. So um, this is important to note. I'm not sure you would get this is quite I struggled with this question. I think I got it wrong when I first tried to answer it. But patients who have stable um, ischemic heart disease or cardiovascular disease who also have developed AF. Um, can generally just be managed on a DOAC or a NOAC and you can stop their antiplatelet therapy. Thank you. And last question. So I'll grab the polls open for this one. So 52 year old man with a history of hypertension has a Q risk score of 28%. Again, Q risk is something really important worth revising. Um, and GP decides to start 20 milligrams of the Torvastatin at night. LFTs are performed. So these are his LFTs pre-starting the statin, as you can see, all within normal range. And three months later, you can see that his ALKFOS has raised slightly. Uh, ALT has raised considerably more. And his uh, GGT, no, GT is also raised. So what do you think would be the appropriate course of action for this patient? And I'll give you a minute. Hmm. Amazing. So the answer is actually continue and repeat his LFTs in a month. So remember um, treatment should be discontinued if it's three months, if if the um, liver derangement or uh, transaminase um, derangement persists after three months, um, oh, sorry, persists at three times the upper limit, sorry, um, of the reference range. So you can monitor for up to three months every month, checking to see if the ALT or AST is rising beyond three times the upper limit of normal. Okay. So again, important question. I'm not sure if that is exam fodder, but I thought it'd be useful. So these are references we used. I will change the slides to make sure that the answer for the previous question was circled correctly. Here's the feedback as well, and I will hand it back to Ash. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. Thanks again, Lakshmi, for doing the session. So please do fill in the feedback form, and if you are watching the recording on YouTube, and please fill it in because any feedback is useful and you'll also get access to the slides um, once you submit.